It is remarkable in the era of swift voting and official campaign commercials featuring images of Osama bin Laden that any campaign would actually spend more than an hour per year bemoaning a perceived imbalance in media coverage of its candidate. Yet in our third story tonight, a longtime John McCain aide has shot Newsweek an email complaining of media bias for Barack Obama. The method behind the madness and a man who has seen the political media as both participant and recipient, Bill Moyers, in just a moment. The McCain broadside was triggered by a Newsweek piece that included this quotation about the general election. Quote, it's going to be swift boat times five on both sides. A prediction given a little more credence regarding McCain than Obama, considering the source was an unnamed McCain advisor. Longtime McCain aide Mark Salter accused Newsweek of buying Obama's spin for suggesting that McCain could stop the independent groups known as 527s from running smear ads against Obama. This despite Newsweek quoting McCain's own former strategist John Weaver, charging that McCain, quote, could say if any major donors or political operators do that, then you will be persona non grata in my administration. Instead, Salter used the unflattering Newsweek image as a fig leaf to justify his own announcement that as far as those unofficial 527 ads go, all bets are off. Joining us tonight, a media giant, the host of Bill Moyers' Journal, former press secretary to President Johnson, now author of Moyers on Democracy. Well, it's a pleasure to see you here, sir. Good to see you, too. Um, what is this all about? Is uh, McCain camp, do you think, with, with, with your experience on both sides of this ball, are they setting a baseline? Are they working the refs before the game starts? They're what working the refs. Yeah. You, you, can, you, you do that to put the other side on the defensive, put the press on the defensive, make them come around. You also do it because it's still popular in this country to harangue the press. I yeah. mean, you, you, can get, you can get people on your side just by coming out against, against the force in America that everybody finds some reason to dislike. If, uh, if there are media biases, though, if there's anything tr to it, do you think they're about um, either an individual or towards an individual, or they are, are they about ways of seeing the world and ways of communicating information? You know, I said to a reporter many years ago, 40 years ago, who was just back from, from Vietnam, who's telling the truth out there? Mm -hmm. He said, everyone. Everyone sees what's happening through the lens of his own experience. That's part of it. Part of it is there is partisan bias in some segments of the press. There's ideological bias. We've had the rise in your time and mine of a very partisan ideological press. They see the press, they see the world through a certain way, and they want you to see it or else if you don't. Uh, and part of it is simply the fact that um, the, the bias in the media is toward simplification. Mm -hmm. You know, beware the terrible simplifiers, said the great Swiss historian Jacob Burkhardt. Uh, and that is the danger that we all face in, in simplifying things. I once did an interview with Saul Bellow, the great novelist, when I was at CBS. He said, more years the day will come when nobody will be heard who doesn't speak in short bursts of truth. Well, sometimes, as Jonathan Alter said in the green room a moment ago, you can speak and not be heard. But for sure you won't be heard unless you learn to speak in a way of, in, in bumpers, with bumper stickers. Yeah, well, obviously that, that, that can be violated on occasion, as I think your, your career has proved. And you know, certain bursts of things from here have suggested that we can break through that every once in a while. But having said that, clearly the tendency is towards truncating everything, condensing everything into that eventual black hole of information where nothing escapes. How does it apply as you look, look ahead towards this general election campaign? How does it apply to each of the candidates in turn? I think it means for all of them that they won't really get to uh, the, the, the deep, profound, uh, structural uh, problems that we face as a country. We're not going to have a discourse in this campaign over the fact that the great American wealth machine is benefit only those at the top. We're not going to get to the fact that 10% of the people own 60% of the wealth and 70% of the people have no net worth. We're not going to get to the issues of how do we rebuild the infrastructure, the sewer, the water, the highways, all of that. We're just going to be constantly in this battle of bumper stickers. Does it, but do you see perhaps a possibility of breaking through that because of what happened when one of the candidates in the Democratic race positioned herself behind an obviously viscerally pleasing idea to suspend the gas tax for a period of time and was kicked in the butt by by the by the candidate who went no this is this is pandering and the voters seemed to agree with him I, I was greatly encouraged by the fact that people saw through uh, that flimsy rationale for the gas tax I was also greatly encouraged uh, by the fact that the Jeremiah Wright fracas did not bring uh, Barack Obama down mm -hmm. it I've never seen anything like this in my long career. I've seen the politics of personal destruction, but never have I seen a pastor and a parishioner come to such grief 
in public and, and, and the prisoner have to break with his pastor. I thought that would hurt Obama in Indiana and even in North Carolina, where, by the way, the bond between the congregation and the pulpit in those African-American churches where I've done films before, documentaries before, so strong. But the, the voters in Indiana and in North Carolina sifted through that and saw that guilt by association, as Jonathan Alter said earlier, isn't going to work. People realize that that the right wing and, and, and some in the partisan and mainstream press were trying to link the man who was running for president in the pew with the man who wasn't running for president in the pulpit. And they made a distinction. And that ability to reach nuance is a very uh, a saving grace in America. One reason, and Jonathan and I were talking about this earlier, is also we now have the Internet, right. which is an antidote uh, to the herd of the, of the mainstream media, so that, as Jonathan was saying to me earlier, six million people actually saw Obama's Philadelphia speech on civil rights on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's a marvelous way for people to judge for themselves what they've seen only in sound bites on the evening news. All right, so uh, my last point here. Now, you want to take this opportunity to confess your role in the whole strategy that, that allowed Obama to, to cut himself away from Jeremiah Wright. That was, all, that was all planned where he looked good on your show and then go to the National Press Club and kind of not look so good. We all were in the same prayer meeting. We saw the vision at the same time. No, after, after the th whole thing broke, I'm in the same fellowship uh, of churches that, oh, that Jeremiah Wright uh, belongs to, but I have never met the man. Mm -hmm. And after all this broke, I was, I was wanting to know who is this man, what's his ministry, what's he about? And several African-American preachers called me at the, and theologians and said, why don't we do a roundtable discussion on black liberation theology? I said, guys, nobody will get it unless Jeremiah Wright speaks for himself. If he wants to come on my show, mm -hmm. that's fine. And he did. That was on Friday. And Monday he went to the National Press Corps and people have stopped me on the street and written me to say, how do you explain that a man who could be so reasonable on Friday night could be so angry on, on Monday morning? And I said, well, he's like all the rest of us. I mean, I think he was angry that out of 205,711 minutes of preaching at 11 o'clock on Sunday over 36 years, uh, 15 to 20 seconds were how his ministry was going to be described. I think he was angry because he was worried about bringing Obama down. Mm -hmm. There was anger in him. He said some absurd things, right. but uh, they were all, most of them taken out of context. And, uh, and he did not have the, uh, the good fortune to have you there at the press club with him. <laughs> Bill Moyers, uh, now the author of the new book, Moyers on Democracy. Uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you. And a reminder... If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator. <laughs>